Well, so glad uh, for you guys to be here. We are wrapping up our Romans 8 study, and uh, it's been a great, kind of great study. So this is kind of our, our wrap-up, and uh, what we've been interesting to see over the last uh, couple of months, uh, the first seven chapters of Romans is kind of Paul uh, kind of venting his frustration and struggle with sin, and then in Romans 8, uh, what many call the greatest chapter in the Bible Uh, you've got this idea that comes out where Paul says, hey, he's confident in victory because of the Holy Spirit. And so he's confident in victory because the Holy Spirit lives within him. And we've kind of walked through that over the last couple weeks, talked a lot about Holy Spirit. This is amazing. I I was uh, studying this week, found this out. In the first seven chapters of the book, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit one time. First seven chapters, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit one time. In Romans 8, he mentions the Holy Spirit 22 times. So the whole chapter full, if you go through in the ESV and you count Spirit or Holy Spirit 22 times, does he do that? And part of Paul's excitement is he's, he's really excited about uh, the thrill of being indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And so um, what I want to do today, you've got your hand out. I've called it eight from eight. So tonight we've done everything with eight, right? Uh, we've talked about crazy eight and, and, and sports if you're not a sports guy, you had to endure that, all right? Maybe uh, you, you knew Dell Hart Jr., all right? Uh, but uh, we've kind of focused on eight. What we're going to uh, do now, we're going to kind of walk through a little bit of Romans 8, uh, and we're going to talk about eight things about the Holy Spirit from Romans 8. Uh, so I just said it was eight from eight, and we're going to run through. And I've already listed them for you on your sheet, so for those of you that... You know, if I believe a blank and you miss a blank and you, you know, you're lost the rest of the night because you missed out on what, what, how you filled it in, I went ahead and put that. And then uh, there's a lot of scriptures. You'll notice the first bullet point uh, for every heading is from Romans chapter 8. It's where I pulled uh, whatever title. So uh, whatever point that I'm making about the Holy Spirit, I pulled it directly from Romans 8. And then I've added some more scripture for you as well. That's for you to take and walk through. But we'll go through and talk about the eight things that Paul identifies uh, about the Holy Spirit and what he does within us as uh, true believers. And a great way to kind of um, wrap up Romans 8 because many of the things the Holy Spirit does, uh, we're going to be able to kind of walk through and have a gospel call tonight because there's some very specific things uh, that the Holy Spirit does in relation to a Christ follower. Um, And um, I think you'll be challenged by it tonight. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into these, uh, these eight things about the Holy Spirit. So let me pray. Lord, I just love you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with our friends and guys around the table and just be encouraged, have some, have some fun, be able to talk and connect and talk about what's happening in our week. And uh, Father, as we open up uh, your word and we walk through so many scriptures over the next uh, little bit, uh, that Father, that um, you'll just uh, 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 pierce calloused hearts that need to be pierced. Uh, encourage hearts that need to be encouraged. And Lord, for those uh, that are walking with you, we can just celebrate uh, what you've done in our life. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful for the Holy Spirit as Christ followers. Uh, We're so grateful for a helper. We're so uh, grateful that um, this is the way you have planned it out. And um, Lord, that means as Christ followers that we have you with us at all times. And so, Father, we're so grateful for that. Um, Be with us as we kind of walk through uh, these next few minutes and just uh, let it be a challenge to us and let it be an encouragement to us. And it's your name I pray. Amen. So the very first thing uh, that Paul identifies about the Holy Spirit is he says he gives us life. He gives us life. And so um, I tried to put all of Romans 8 on the little, like, column on the right side. Uh, if you can read that, you have good eyesight. If you can't read it, then you're with me. I, it's, you know, I need a magnifier. And so it is the full, all 39 verses on the front and back. If you flip it over, it's all of Romans 8 when you go through. And so Romans 8, 2, uh, when it talks about that the Holy Spirit gives us life, Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And the thing that uh, Romans kind of talks about is death or life is a choice that we're all going to make. We're all going to make a choice if we're going to live a life that ends in death or if we're going to live a life that ends in life. And Scripture in Romans 8, 2, when he comes in, he says, For the law of the Spirit, he set you free. And how did he do that? He did it through Christ Jesus. And he set us free from, um, really, the law of sin and and, and death. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Uh, Romans 3.10 says, as it's written, none are righteous, no, not one. So that means right from the beginning, and we've heard this walking through the beginning of Romans 8, it says that we're all ugly sinners. What we also talked about is even as Christ followers, we're all ugly sinners. Paul himself was struggling. Why do I keep doing what I know I'm not supposed to do, and why do I not do what I know Uh, You know, it's that argument that keeps coming back, and I think that's the argument that sometimes we have internally, where we want to do something that we know is wrong, we're trying to figure out the consequences, but most of the time as guys, we just act without thinking, and then the consequences come at us pretty fast and heavy. And so in this, it says that the Holy Spirit gives us life, that because that there is none that are righteous, that we're totally unable to please God. Uh, that we fall, in, fall into all kinds of sins. We do it on our own, and then many of us know you put a group of guys together and we can do some of the dumbest stuff you've ever thought about. And so that is what he's talking about, that we have all these kind of affections and all these like sinful behaviors that come out, and we recognize that even in our culture, those kind of sins are celebrated more and more. When some of you guys were little, can you imagine some of the sins that are celebrated today, how they were responded and, and, and looked at back then? I mean, the world, when we talk about a slippery slope, we're talking about a very slippery slope. And culture is recognizing that uh, things that we would go, man, you shouldn't do that. Not only now should you not do it, it's celebrated when you do do it. And so what's taking place is that we've got all of these sinful behaviors and vile affections that are coming in, and we're being presented in culture as everything is okay and mankind is good, Um, but that kind of lifestyle, though it may be excused by man, um, God hates it. And that's a strong word, right? When you say you hate something, that's a strong word. And there's not a lot of things that Scripture tells us that God hates. It says that God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. He hates sin. I remember when I was in a middle school, um, I was walking in. A, I was in a, a student ministry, and our student pastor was talking. and And one of those verses that catches a young boy. I've shared this with you before. He catches a young boy, and it's talking. Of, it, it talks about the word vomit. Right? There's two times in scripture I can think of that says vomit. One. Um, you've got uh, Jonah that gets vomited out of the well, and the, the other was um, if you are lukewarm, right? that he wants to vomit you like lukewarm milk. Like when we act lukewarm, when we are playing on one side and acting like we're playing church here, and then we're playing culture here, and we're in the middle, the Bible says that God, that a lukewarm man, that he just wants to vomit out. That he just wants to spit him out. Meaning it's not good. Like you can't have two faces be a Christ follower. We all know, man, God knows what's going on. You can fool the guys at your table. You can fool the guys in this room. I promise you can fool me. But who you can't fool is the only one that really matters. The audience of one, he knows. And so you can play games all you want, but realize you're not playing a game with God. I got a 10-year-old son, and sometimes we'll go back and forth, and he'll be doing something, and I'll say, all right, buddy, here's the deal. I'm done playing games. Go do whatever I've asked you to do. Remember, some of you dads have done that, right? Like, all, like any kind of, you're joking or you're doing stuff, that was all cute for the first three minutes. But now I'm telling you, let's go do what I'm asking you to do. And, he, and then, you know, when you do that, he's like, oh. Then it's, yes, sir. You know, and now, you know it changes behavior. God's saying, hey, I, I'm done playing games. Your lukewarmness, I'm done with that. And some of us just see, yes, sir. Because for us, if our lifestyle is hated by God, he tells us what the consequence is. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Wages is something you earn. So because of your sin, you earn death. That's what you get. And death means separation from God. And the place that God is not is hell. The place that God is is heaven. I was telling somebody, we were talking the other day, I said, you know why hell is so bad? Because God's not there. You know why heaven's so good? Because God's there. 
You know why hell's so bad? Because God's not there. That means there's no love there. There's no joy there. There's no hope there. There's no peace there. There's definitely no patience in hell. There's no self-control in hell. Hell sounds like hell, doesn't it? And the reason it's so bad is because God's not there. You know why heaven's so good? Because God's there. You know, since God's there, that means love is there. That means joy is there. And it's joy. It's not based on I feel good because of my circumstances. It feels good because God's there. That's why it feels so good. Peace is there and patience is there. Hope's there and self-control is there. You can walk through and see why is heaven so good because, man, that's where God is. But God hates sin. And for those of us that are caught up in sin and we don't have the Holy Spirit, then the future is hell for the wages of sin is death. And so the first thing that Paul says about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit gives us life. After there's conviction in the sinner, the solution, the solution for those of us that have said, hey, we're in living a sinful lifestyle and there's no hope and we're on a pathway of letting God down and he hates it and he hates what we're doing, the solution is that Jesus died for us. Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for me. That while I was still in rebellion with God, he loved me enough to send Jesus to take my place. Ultimately, God, who is the greatest, we heard that a couple of weeks from Pastor Allen, God, who is the greatest, who was first, made himself last so that I could be first. Think about that. God who is first made himself last so that I could be first. Put yourself in I. The reason that you, even though you are a sinful guy, the reason that you can be perf perfect in front of God is because of your relationship with Jesus. God shows his love that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us, and once you accept Christ, then here comes the Holy Spirit. He moves in just like that. We've talked about that over. We've had some, I've had some questions and some emails from some guys in the room that's talked a little bit about baptism of the Spirit. And they said, hey, does baptism of the Spirit say, happen at the same time that I'm dunked in the pool? Like, is that baptism? And I'm like, no, that's completely different. Baptism in the pool doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Baptism in the pool has to do with obedience. That you say, hey, I'm a Christ follower, and I want everyone to know. And I'm telling all my brothers and sisters that I am who I am. I'm a follower of Christ. I wasn't at one point, and now I am. Sometimes you'll see people get up in the baptistry, and they've been believers for 50 years. They just haven't followed in obedience. They haven't stood up and said, hey, this is who I am. And then on the response, we don't talk about this a lot, but if, if the church is watching that, then there's some accountability on behalf of the church to say, hey, I know who you are. And then in love, there's some accountability in that because now they're part of the family. And people get baptized at Baptist churches and different kind of churches that believe in Christ, and if they're Bible-believing, people get baptized all the time, and they're all our family. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know why we can call them our brothers and sisters? Because we all got the same daddy. And so the setup comes in, and it says in this, it says that God showed his love while we're still sinners, that Christ died for us, and then the Holy Spirit, the part that happens is when you place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he knows you can't do it by yourself, so he sends a helper. It's part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you immediately upon your decision to trust in Christ. It says now, Romans 6, 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. And so once you accept Christ, you have eternal life, eternal life in heaven, eternal life with God the Father, eternal life where God resides. And then the end of Romans 6.23, if it says, for the wages of sin is death, the beautiful part of Romans 6.23, it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If, if wages is something, if the sin and the wages is what we earn and we get death, 
then man, praise be to God that he gives us a free gift. We don't really earn it, do we? He gives it to us. And he does it because of our relationship with Christ Jesus. And so, all of a sudden, that takes place. We trust in Christ, and now we have new life imparted to us. We now are going to experience delivery from, uh, deliverance from the slavery of sin. And it's going to enable us to live righteous in the eyes of God. Why are we now righteous in the eyes of God? Because he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. Because of your relationship with Jesus, God's going to say, Hey, you know my son, and there's only one way to get to heaven. There's not a lot of ways. You'll talk to some people, sometimes they'll tell you, Man, you go your way, and I'll go my way. And I usually tell them, Man, let me just tell you, if you're not going the way of Jesus, then you're going the wrong way. And so the Paul says the Holy Spirit gives us life. And then he tells us he's going to help us fight sin. Romans 8, 5 jumps in. It says, for those who live according to the flesh sets their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. As believers, later in Romans, in Romans 6, 11 through 13, this is, this is what it said. It says, believers are to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, but make, but make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as, though, as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God's as instruments for righteousness. Man, that's telling you that, hey, temptations in life are going to swirl around. I've, I've joked before and especially when I was a college pastor, and I've said this probably in here, I'll say, hey, just because you become a Christ follower doesn't mean everything's going to be rainbows and unicorns and cotton candy. It's not just all sweet and perfect. And I've had many college students who said, well, man, I trusted in Christ last week. How come bad things have happened to me this week? I thought it was all going to be good. I thought everything was going to be great. Everything was going to be rosy. And, and now bad things have happened. Like, you didn't tell me about all that. Man, I was tempted this past week, and I fell flat. And I thought Jesus was going to protect me from all that junk I was doing before. And I say, well, temptations are going to keep swirling around you. The world's still a fallen place. Culture's still celebrating things that are sinful. But with the Spirit, you got a shot. The Spirit's going to convict you and you're going to feel it. I don't know about you, but when I make a wrong choice, I know, I know I made a wrong choice almost immediately. You know what I'm talking about? Like you do something, and then that guilt kind of jumps in, and you feel it, and you're like, man, maybe that was the wrong choice. Maybe that wasn't what I was supposed to do. Maybe, and all of a sudden, I'm like, like, I can just start feeling it, and then I'm like, man, I, gotta, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to say that again. Man, I, I don't want to look at that again. I, I can feel that conviction that comes through. And because of the Holy Spirit that I've got a life that there's a, a feeling of peace. You ever went to a decision, you're trying to really make a decision, and you don't know what to do, and really the answer is I just want to have peace with the decision I'm making. You ever been there? I mean, it could be anything. I, hey, we're thinking about moving to Naples. Man, I don't know if we're supposed to. Man, houses are like $8 million down there. I don't know. And uh, I don't know if we're supposed to do it. Lord, just give me peace. You ever prayed that? I, I, hey, I'm at this one job. This other guy's offering me something. Man, I don't know what to do. Man, I just wish I'd have peace about it. Man, I just need some direction. Man, there's a carton of ice cream in front of me. Should I eat all of that? Lord, just give me peace. You know, I mean, there's these I, situations that come up all the time that we're constantly trying to think. And it says, hey, the spirit within you, man, you, you have a life that you have a helper you're not doing it by yourself. There's no temptation that's too great that his spirit cannot deliver you from. You ever talk to somebody about going to church or knowing Jesus? You ever talk to them and they're like, man, there's no way I could go there. Man, I've done so much bad stuff. I mean, there's no way God could forgive me for all the junk I've done. And I bet some of you guys in this room have said the same thing. But guess what? Some of you can testify. God is bigger than our sin. 
And, and in this, it comes in and it says there's no temptation that will ever be so great that his spirit cannot deliver us from. And that he's going to lead us. He's going to direct us. Man, thank you so much for the spirit that provides conviction and provides opportunities for us to make right choices and to correct the wrong choices that we fall into, right? Third thing that Paul says is the spirit resurrects the dead. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says we are always of good courage and we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Let me say that again. That when we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. That Here's the deal. We're not physically going to be here forever. These earthly bodies are falling apart. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so, man, that pre preach. Yes, amen, right? <laughs> and that same Holy Spirit, this is what the verse says, that same Holy Spirit um, that raised Jesus from the, dead, from the dead is going to give your bodies a resurrection. All the dead in Christ will at the call at God's call, they're going to rise together. And the Holy Spirit's going to direct us to the throne of our Savior. O oh, death, where is your victory? There's going to be a day that it's coming. I grew up in a little, little town in North Georgia, and there's little Southern Baptist churches, and, and I remember going to these little tent revivals, and it'd be 140 degrees outside, and that would be the perfect time to talk about hell. And those preachers would say, you think it's hot now. You know, you don't know. And then they'd start talking. They'd say, hey, are you ready for the day to when, when this, this, this earthly time is done? Are you ready for it? They'd start preaching and spitting and wiping their heads. And, I mean, they'd be all fired up. And, and there'd be people going forward because they wanted hell insurance. People say, I don't want to go to hell, right? I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. That sounds like a horrible place. I don't want to go. And I'd say, well, what, what do you want to do? I, I don't, I don't want to go there. I said, what about Jesus? Well, I mean, I hope he's not in hell because it sound, doesn't sound good for him either, you know? <laughs> I say, well, the reason the hell's so bad is because God's not there. You want to go to heaven. Well, that's not hell. And I'd be like, wait a minute, you're missing the whole point. The point's not about hell. The, whole, the point is about Jesus. Don't, don't get lost in getting hell insurance and saying, I don't want to deal with bad stuff. The point of the whole thing is that God is good enough and that we can trust him with our lives on this earth and we can trust him for eternity. And what the Holy Spirit says is he resurrects the dead, that it's the same, the same one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is also going to be the same one that raises our mortal bodies. And as, as Christ followers, he'll raise our mortal bodies and he will walk us to the throne of our Savior. I was talking to somebody about that last week, and we were talking about the, the throne, and, and the guy said, what do you, the, this, is, this is how conversations happen all the time. What do you think you'll do when you see Jesus in heaven? And so immediately I thought of this song, I Can Only Imagine. Remember that song that came out? Like, I said, I, man, I don't know. I said, I can talk as much as anybody, but I may be out of words. I may be jumping up and shouting, but more than likely, I'm just going to be crying. I may be bowing, and, and like, but I said, I got all eternity to just deal with all of it. I'm going to cry. I'm going to shout. I'm going to talk. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to worship him. Like, I don't know. And he's like, yeah, I don't know what I'll do either. I was like, I said all those words, and that's all you're giving back? Like, I don't know either. And the idea is the Holy Spirit's going to take us to the throne. But I just still love the picture. There's God the Father at the throne. How am I going to respond? I love that. Fourth thing Paul tells us about the Holy Spirit is he gives us power over sin. Romans 8, 12 through 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He gives us power over sin. Romans 13, at the beginning, Paul says this, Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. And the Holy Spirit uses God's power to help us put to death. Therefore, what is earthly in you, Colossians 3, 5 starts mentioning them. Sexual immorality, impurities, passion, evil desires, covetousness, idolatry. It says the Holy Spirit gives us strength to put to death the sins of the flesh. The things that we struggle with. Listen. I was telling Cannon, my 10-year-old, the other day, we were talking about something, and, and I had a conversation with him, and he had done something he shouldn't do, and I said, man, how do you feel about it? And he said, well, I don't feel good about it. I said, well, that's, that's good that you don't feel good about it. He said, you mean there's people that do things and they don't feel bad when they do bad things? I said, yeah. I said, some people don't know any better, buddy. Some people are just doing the same thing their daddies did and the same thing their granddaddies did, and they're doing what they see on TV, and, and they don't really have any conviction over it because to them it's not anything that's wrong because their foundation of right and wrong is all jacked up. There's some people that are enslaved in their sin, and they don't even realize it. If you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as a Christ follower, then there's conviction. Whatever sin you've lived in the past, if I'm sitting here telling you, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of that, Maybe even now he's convicting you of some sin in your life and something that even took place earlier today. And you're like, man, I'm feeling it right now. Because the Holy Spirit gives us power over sin. Fifth thing that Paul says that the Holy Spirit does is he leads us. Romans 8, 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. He constantly leads us through the study of his word. He leads us through prayer. He leads us through in godly instruction. Maybe you've got a mentor, some friends, or some pastors, and they're talking about godly things, and the Holy Spirit comes in and, and helps us and leads us. You ever feel like your day is pretty complex? Like there's a lot going on? Work's going on. Family stuff's going on. You turn on the news and there's crazy stuff going on. And you're just like, man, this is so complex. I wish it would just be easy. You ever, you ever wish that? And God says, hey, I know it's crazy. And so I've got somebody that's going to lead you through the maze of your events. I'm going to send you a helper. And the Holy Spirit's always going to lead a Christ follower in the path of righteousness. And for us, we just got to keep our hearts set on him, and, and he's going to kind of lead the way. And it's like, you ever done this? Some of you that have been daddies and granddaddies and your kids running in the parking lot, and you just kind of reach down and you grab their hand. Why do you grab their hand? So they don't get ran over, right? Because the parking lot at Target and at Walmart is a pretty, like, crazy place. I've got a 16-year-old daughter. You know what I still do? Grab her hand. I'm like, hey, let's just get through this crazy maze. And she's usually like, dad. And I'll say, I love you too. I love you so much, I'm trying not to get you ran over. And in the same way in our crazy days, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, I got you. Let's walk through this craziness together. Sometimes we're like, Dad. He's like, I love you. Let's get through this together. And it comes in, and this is what it says, the Holy Spirit leads us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
That's what Hebrews tells us. Another thing Paul tells us about the Holy Spirit is he adopts us as heirs. Romans 8, 15 and 16, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We're transformed from slaves of sin into children of God. Let me say that again. You're transformed from slaves of sin to children of God. That's a miracle. That's miraculous. That's extraordinary. That's unbelievable. That we are, this is what it says, that it comes in and it tells us that we are slaves of sin. We can't help it. We got to do it. We don't know any better. And when we do it, we're not even convicted by it because it's just normal. No one teaches a preschooler to say mine. They just do it automatically. They want to they get all they can and then can all they get. Nobody teaches them to sin. And so we go from the slavery of sin, and it says then we become children of God because he has adopted us. We're children of God. Somebody, I, I, I might have said this in here before, but one time somebody, I, I was looking for an answer, and this just kind of popped out, but somebody said, hey, how do you know you're a Christ follower? So what if you have the Holy Spirit? And the person was like, oh, that's a good answer. I was like, oh, it really was. That really was a good answer. Just kind of came out. You know how you're you know how you know you're a Christ follower? Because you have the Holy Spirit. As Christ followers, God's going to send the Holy Spirit to live within you. And He's going to indwell within you. And you're going to be part of the family, and you're going to be a permanent member of the family of God forever. Your eternal record is going to be sealed. You're going to be a son of God forever because you've been paid for by the blood of Christ. And then, if anybody questions it, the Holy Spirit is going to testify on your behalf, yeah, 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 he's part of the family. And when, when you get to heaven and they're going to be like, hey, who is this guy? Holy Spirit's going to go, no, 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 we're going to the throne. I know this guy. He belongs in this house. I've got a passcode, and it's written all in the blood of Jesus, and we're going straight there. And the Holy Spirit's going to testify on your behalf because we're adopted as heirs. Paul says the seventh thing is he gives us hope of resurrection. Romans 8, 22 and 23, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons and the redemption of our bodies. Man, talking about a hope of resurrection, that after death we're going to rise to glory, just as Scripture promises us. Seth, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. I read that earlier. When we're in our body, we're not with the Lord, right? And one day, when our time in this, this body that's falling apart, when it ends, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. And then those who die in the Lord are going to be instantly with him. Christ followers just going to be in the presence of the Lord. And then he's going to raise our bodies in his timing. That's what the Bible says. And so our physical death is, is really a victory, isn't it? I mean, that should be comforting to us. That there's a promise of resurrection and eternity with God is promised forever. Had a great conversation with Cannon a couple of years ago and he said, and this is a great question from an eight-year-old, if heaven is so good with God, why can't we go there now? Isn't that a good question? You don't know my answer? Because we got work to do. Because we're going to go one day, buddy, and we're going to take as many people with us as we can. 
if God wanted us to come up as soon as we trusted in him, then the moment we said the prayer and said, I trust in you, Lord, we'd just go straight to heaven and it'd be all it. Because that, if that was all God really wanted from us is for us to place our trust in him, then the moment we placed our trust in Christ, he would just bring us home. Because home is unbelievable. We're just hanging out in apartments right now. You know that, right? We're, we're like on little mini mission trips. We're in the huts. We're in the, the, the rental houses. We're there. Home is still to come. Right? And so this is temporary for us. And, but what he said is the reason it's temporary, the reason he doesn't bring us up is because he said you got work to do. He tells us to go and make disciples. Man, our timing is going to come. For some, it comes when they're young. For some, it comes when they're a lot older. I was on an airplane the other day. Got a chance to speak to a lady who was standing next to me. And so airplane, good time to chat with somebody, Right? If you sat next to me, you'd hate it because I, I mean, you're going to know your life story by the time we land. And so, lady next to me, I said, so are you coming or are you going? <laughs> and she said, what did you say? You know what? Hey, earbuds red. I'm like, I'm trying to talk to you, lady. Like, let's talk, right? I said, are you coming or are you going? She said, I am going back home. I've been in Florida. I'm Benita. We just celebrated my mom's 104th birthday. I said, man, I bet she's got some stories. And that was probably the wrong question. So for the next three hours, I heard them all, right? (laughs) Heard them all, heard all those stories. She shared all kinds of things with me. And in that, I got to tell, we talked about all kinds of stuff. Talked about the church she grew up in, talked about her mom going to church, talked about the church that she attends. But in the midst of it, she's a church attender. She's not a follower of Jesus. So we talked about that. She talked about when she was little, she did stuff to make her mom happy. Listen, finally she said, so what do you do for a living? (laughs) I told her I was a motivational speaker. So uh, I said, I, I said, I get it. I get the opportunity to work at a church. And she said, you're a pastor, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, your eyes give it away. She said, ever since you sat down, your eyes have been sparkling Jesus. And I started crying. Because I know that I got a hope of a resurrection. And one day, when it's my time, that God's going to say, come on home, buddy. And when he does, there's going to be a celebration. This room's a room that we have a lot of funerals here at the church. Some of you have been able to attend a funeral here, and we don't typically call them funerals, do we? As Christ followers, we call them celebrations of life. Because we celebrate a life well lived, and we celebrate their home going. Because many of the guys and ladies that are in this room, they've checked out of the apartment, and they're heading home. And we get to celebrate that. And for those of you in the room, we're going to celebrate one day, I hope, a lot of celebrations of your home going. Last thing that it says that the Holy Spirit does is it says, He assists us in prayer. Romans 8, 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And isn't it precious to know that the Holy Spirit is assisting you in your prayers? That he sees every problem that's going on in your life and he leads you to the best decision for every request, for every request you're making. You ever ever been in a situation where you didn't have the words to pray? All you had was tears and moans. You ever been there? You just didn't know what to say, and and, and at some point you start mumbling, God, I just hope you're getting this. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf that he goes even deeper than our groans and our mumbles and he knows exactly what to say to the Father. I 
Man, there's, as I'm standing up here, I think of specific times where I've just kind of been in a fetal position just asking God why. And my groans just go, and I'm so thankful that I've got someone. I, I was listening to a podcast not too long ago, and the pastor, was, the pastor that was doing talked about this, and he said something that I even thought was interesting. He said a lot of times, you know, when we're praying, we'll just say like, oh, man, I just pray for my kids. Man, I just pray for our family. I pray for my wife. And the guy was like, do you realize how empty that prayer is? Just like, I'm praying for my wife. And just let, like, like that's such an overarching, I'm, I'm praying for my kids. He was like, that's so, but yet the Spirit knows your heart. And so even though you don't know what to pray, the Spirit says, no, 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 man, I'm not going to the King of Kings with that. Let me intercede for you and let me lay out what your heart's really saying because, brother, you're not saying the words that your heart's calling out. I thought, man, that is, I need that sometimes, don't you? Don't you sometimes when you're like, hey, man, pray for this knucklehead. Man, he's not had the best of days, Lord. And, and then all of a sudden my prayer turns into like a pep talk for him. Lord, just help him like pay attention, let him focus, like let him listen to his daddy. You know, that turns into the prayer. And the Holy Spirit's like, wait, 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 hold on. Your prayer's not a prayer of rebuke. Man, I want to twist that around and I want to give him a prayer of, of, of just revelation so that he loves the Lord. I want to give you, Daddy, uh, some wisdom in how you can help him grow. I want to give you an opportunity so you're not just frustrated and your prayer is not just a frustrated prayer, but your prayer is one to encourage him and to help him. How many times I feel that? It says that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit assists us in prayer. And Romans 8 is powerful. 22 times Paul talks about the Spirit. I was joking and told somebody in Baptist circles, we don't talk about the Spirit a whole lot. Romans 8, we've been able to spend a lot of time on it. And so my encouragement as we kind of wrap it up, you just don't move through this study and just think, man, that was just some really good information and there's no application on the back end. I mean, I, I pray you've learned more about the Spirit over the last couple of months that you say, man, this is some, I've heard some stuff I've never really heard before. That was, that was really good. I'm glad I came. No, no, my prayer is that you have some boldness to go to the throne of God because of, of understanding who the Spirit is, that you realize that the sin and the things in your life, that you, you have a helper that you can call out. I mean, there's so many things that are in here that is just transforming as a Christ follower. And so I don't want you just to be like, man, that was really good, and walk out the doors the same way you walked in a couple months ago. You ever told somebody, hey, man, I want you to do that. I love you too much to let you stay the same way, right? That's kind of how I feel with you guys. I don't, I don't want you to stay this. I don't want you to be like, well, that's really good. I mean, that'd kind of be an endless speaking engagement, wouldn't it? God is big. He's so big, he knows we need help. He sent us a helper. Guys, you don't have to do it by yourself. There's some table questions we got for you guys, and if you look at the very last one, it says, do you belong to Christ by faith in him? If not, what's holding you back? Guys, I'm asking you to be real on that question tonight. If you don't belong to Christ and you've heard about the Holy Spirit for the last couple of months or you heard about him tonight, and you realize he does not dwell within you because you don't know Jesus, I just ask you to be bold enough to say that to the guys at your table tonight so they can tell you a little bit more about Jesus. Because they too love you too much to leave you where you're at. No one should have to go through this world 
trying to figure it out all by themselves with no hope. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for the study. Lord, I thank you for the men in this room. Lord, what an encouragement they are to me. Lord, just even walking into the room and giving high fives and hugs and just encouragement, seeing faces I see every week and faces I had not seen in months. Lord, what an encouragement it is. And Lord, I, I recognize the guys that come up and they say, man, that, you had it, this is a good week and you're doing this and I have this. And this. But Father, can I just say just publicly how grateful I am for your spirit? that I've got a comforter and a helper. I've got an encourager that's with me all the time, that, Lord, you knew I couldn't do it all by myself. And so, Father, you spent, sent the Holy Spirit that the moment when I was in middle school that I said, Lord, I want you to be in control of my life. Lord, I want you to save me from myself, and I want you to save me from separation from you for all of eternity. And the moment I did that, Lord, you sent me a helper that you loved me so much that you didn't want me to stay where I was. Lord, that's our cry tonight. That if there's a guy in this room that doesn't know you, Lord, that they will be bold enough to share it with some guys around their table. Lord, move in a mighty way. And we thank you for your helper. And it's in the name of Jesus we all pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.